Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sebastian Scheele. I'm one of the founders of Lutze. And with me, I have... I'm Simon Pierce from SIS11 from Berlin. And uh, at SIS11, we're a managed hosting company uh, from Berlin. We've been um, offering our customers managed hosting for the last 10 years. And uh, up to now, it's been a fairly traditional platform. We've been uh, offering virtual uh, Linux containers. We have about 4,000 of them which the majority are managed with Puppet as configuration management and orchestrated via our own tooling over um, various hardware nodes distributed over a few data centers. We also have our own OpenStack cloud, which we run for infrastructure as a service. And we basically wanted to uh, extend that portfolio um, with Kubernetes. So we were looking away what would be the best way for a medium-sized German hosting provider to run a managed Kubernetes offering. And of course, we're not Google, we're not AWS. So uh, we needed to find something else. And uh, our partner, um, Lutzer here, helped us uh, integrate a great installer into our network. Yeah, I'm from Sebastian. Uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm from Lutze. Um, we are a startup from Hamburg. And we built a platform how you can run and manage multiple Kubernetes cluster like a Google Container Engine uh, in your own environment, on OpenStack, on bare metal, um, or on different cloud providers. And together with uh, this 11 we built up the platform for them. Yeah, so we would basically like to uh, take some time to talk with you about that today and basically show us uh, how we did that and uh, give you a short live demo if everything works out as well so you can uh, actually see how that installer runs and how you can basically uh, set up a Kubernetes cluster with a few mouse clicks. So should we get started? Yes. Okay. So basically we start off, what was the uh, challenge for uh, us and also for... Um, for Lutzer. Basically, um, getting a management interface up and running, which would allow us to maintain and um, view multiple clusters. We didn't want to have to log on to each individual cluster or to check the update status of um, the different customer clusters. We wanted to have like a unified web interface where a system engineer can look at and could see the state of the clusters. would we'll be able to start an installation for a customer if he didn't want to do it himself or um, to, um, to see uh, basically the uh, version of uh, Kubernetes which is installed, maybe even add or remove a node. Also, a thing that was very important to us was multi-tenancy, which is something which uh, um, most of the offerings that we've seen up to today seem to lack. Um, they all seem to focus on single projects or to, on single companies. What we, our idea was basically to have this multi-tenancy approach where you could have more than one customer running. And we also wanted the master components as a complete managed service. So we want to take care of the API server, the cube controller, the um, scheduler, and also the ETCD. We want to take all that hassle away from the customers so they don't have to uh, deal with those sort of things and give them the ability to be able to update that, this very quickly if they want to. And also an administration interface where you could maybe at a later date um, change certificates, uh, add users, and do various things um, with the cluster. and also offer a choice of add-ons which could be installed. One to be named here would be a CNI. So you could choose between, for, for instance, Calico, uh, Cano, Flannel. So a customer would be able to have things like network policies if he needed it, or other people might be more interested in BGP networking. So give the customer the choice and allow him during that installation to choose between the different um, network interfaces which exist. The K8S master is run as a container, and it's run in an individual namespace for the customer, which I will show you in detail later on. We also have a single service endpoint which we maintain, which has also been a challenge. We have like one IP address, which is the API um, service, and that endpoint is for all of the customers. So we have multiple clusters running behind one service endpoint which also allows us to do a lot of nice things with that as well. And we can also upgrade multiple clusters as well. So we are able to uh, view all of the clusters, see them, check the upgrade status, and maybe upgrade them all at once. 
Otherwise, you'd be sitting there, you'd have some form of Terraform or maybe Ansible playbooks, and you'd need to um, upgrade every individual cluster, which would take forever, to be honest, and it would also um, bring lots of errors with it as well, trying to do that. We tried it in the past, and it didn't work very well. It scales up to about maybe 10, 20 clusters. But after that, you need so many uh, members of staff to actually deal uh, and manage all the clusters, it just doesn't work out. Another thing is user role management, which is also very important. So you can have um, different roles with RBAC, people that are allowed to deploy to maybe different namespaces. And also provide the customers with um, a unified way to install Helm charts and different things. The idea is uh, later on uh, to have like a service catalog where you'll be able to uh, use a monocular to install uh, various Helm apps and other things from the dashboard. Most of the existing tools, uh, sorry, most of the existing tools uh, focus on a single cluster, but not really on multiple clusters. As I said earlier, most of the um, existing solutions don't really seem to have that um, uh, um, as a model. The access uh, to the K8A's master is also slightly different because behind that one IP address, we don't just have one K8A uh, master running, there are multiple masters running. So we need to find a way to actually uh, get that um, API call to the right master. And I'll show you how we did that later on as well. There are various ways that this can be done. And we require within our installer a minimum of three VMs. Because we're running this on top of OpenStack, you can basically choose the flavor that you want, similar um, that you would do when you uh, spin up a traditional VM uh, with a cloud provider. You can basically choose the flavor, or you can even mix different flavors. But we require that you have a minimum of three VMs so that you can distribute your pods between um, the VMs. Of course, you can, you can uh, add more at any time you want. We can add uh, Prometheus. You can uh, check. Um, the um, utilization of your cluster, and you can add new ones at any time. And that can also be automated as well. And of course, to accomplish this, additional tooling is required. One thing may be a specific proxy to get into the uh, correct cluster. Yeah, and so when we started um, two and a half years ago with customers working on Kubernetes, um, we were also Google uh, Google partner, and when we were on the Google Cloud, it was every time quite easy. Press a button, and you have a cluster. And for other customers, it was every time a challenge. Okay, we built it with their tools, and then it starts every time the same same way. So first, we build up a first cluster. Then they ask, hey, can you help us with updates? Then they come, we also want to have some more clusters. Can you help us building up more clusters to manage them? And um, yeah, we want to have something like a self-service, uh, and it ends. Mostly it was like, yeah, we want to have something like a Google Container Engine, but on our platform. And then we did this a few times for customers, and we were asking ourselves, can't we do this better? Can't we build something which feels and works like probably a Google Container Engine, and the customer can run this and manage this in their own environment, on their own platform, um, like OpenStack, Metal, or even on their own cloud provider? And so. Uh, what we really want to achieve is like um, providing a self-service for the developers. The developers can create and manage their clusters. The IT can concentrate on operating the infrastructure, but the developers can create clusters, can decide on their own when it's time to upgrade my cluster, how do I want to size my cluster. And different teams can have different clusters instead of putting everything in one big cluster. Um, everyone can decide, okay, should I have a bigger cluster or do I want to have smaller clusters? Also, probably building up clusters in your CI pipeline, like you have a work uh, job running, um, you want to test something, spin up quickly a cluster, do your jobs, uh, throw it away again. Um, Another challenge was, of, of course, updates of a cluster. So we really want that the developers can focus on updating the cluster. And it's not a big deal for the operations uh, updating uh, many of the clusters. Uh, as Simon said, um, if you are, have two, five clusters, it's working OK with tools. But if you're going to like 10, 50, 100, and even more clusters, it's uh, getting quite difficult to update, and especially also to provide to your developers different version of, of clusters so that you can manage and uh, run this. 
Um, of course, we also want to install like add-ons, um, um, like CNI uh, add-ons, uh, Helm charts, and the dashboard, so that the customer or the developers can immediately start and don't must think about how do I integrate this, how do I need additional, uh, or what do I must install additional to the plain uh, setup. Um, and of course, we want to have flexibilities in our cluster. So we add, we want to add and remove worker nodes, um, and the developer should decide when it's time to add uh, um, worker nodes. We're currently also working on like uh, cluster auto scaling. That in the future um, we don't want to rely on the cloud provider specific auto scaling. We want to have an uh, integration of the uh, cluster auto scaler so that we can do auto scaling on any platform, and we don't must look into it, how is uh, Google AWS or how is uh, uh, OpenStack doing this? Uh, we can then do it anywhere. Um, yeah, as I said, um, auto scaling of worker nodes, we're currently working on this to get this done. Um, of course, there is a question, how do I work with uh, external load balancers? Um, so we, we, we want to integrate the same with networking, with the existing tooling. Our focus is really spinning up um, all these um, setups um, and yeah, let the customer choose, okay, what's the best networking option? What load balancers do I have in my uh, own uh, cloud? Um, and um, how do I can work closely together with Kubernetes? Um, of course, one important uh, thing is also automatically backup and recovery uh, from the Kubernetes master, um, so um, that we ensure that your etcd master is every time healthy, and in, in the case that something happens, um, your uh, one of the node crash or the complete Chrome is lost, that we can recover your etcd and um, that you don't must manually uh, interact with it so that it's completely automated and uh, the system is completely running um, out of the box and you don't have much to do. And what we mainly do is um, we come up with the idea what's the best way or how we can run a lot of Kubernetes cluster and we ask ourselves can't we run Kubernetes on Kubernetes? Um, so uh, what we spin up is we have uh, one management Kubernetes cluster and on this Kubernetes cluster uh, we spin up for each cluster in a namespace all the compu uh, components uh, Kubernetes uh, needs. And um, then we can connect from the outside world, like from uh, OpenStack, uh, the worker nodes from the specific cluster so that it's connected um, and connected to the specific cluster. We only need one dedicated IP address for all of these clusters connected and um, yeah, have an uh, SSH tunnel uh, that the API server can talk to the, to the nodes and uh, do some stuff there. But that's our main setup. What we technically built is like a Kubernetes operator uh, which knows how to deploy and to uh, upgrade Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but in that way that we only need this operator more or less for the for the startup and for the upgrade phase. Afterwards, you could completely remove our operator out of it. The clusters are working. And the good thing is because it's running on Kubernetes, when something is failing, like when the API server is crashing, it's automatically restarted. And um, updates of the master control plane is for us quite easy. We do a rolling update uh, from Kubernetes and uh, we are done. So um, yeah, and this we can easily then move also to different cloud providers and integrating new cloud providers now takes us between like two to 10 days because we only must look into it how we can connect the uh, worker nodes to it and on the worker nodes we only need like a container runtime, we need the kubelet, we must configure uh, the kubelet with a, a token of the API server and the URL of the API server and then we are done and all of the rest we then roll out again with um, Kubernetes itself. So the networking is uh, rolled out with daemon sets and all the rest also. Um, and we saw in the talk before, uh, they had the discussion about uh, machine API and cluster API. Um, we come up with a similar concept. We, called it, uh, we call it node set. We are also currently uh, in discussion uh, with the guys um, how we can combine these both uh, concepts together because they are from the concept side, quite close together. Uh, from the technical implementation side, there are some difference, but we want to make it, um, yeah, align. We want to have an alignment, and um, yeah, in best case, get it as close to Kubernetes as possible. And the idea is like really. When we started, we were thinking, okay, why can I not manage um, with Kubernetes uh, nodes? So we come up with the idea, hey, 
we need something like nodes, we need something like a node set, like a replica set, and then we want to have a, a node set controller who every time checks how many nodes should I um, start, and then it creates a node resource, and then we have a node controller which talks to the specific uh, cloud provider API and spin up the nodes, and then it's configured, and so that we have the complete flexibility. Um, of course, we are dealing on the one side um, with quite a lot of um, um, cloud providers, but on the other side also uh, enterprise customers who want to run hybrid setups, and their authorization and access management is every time a challenge. So uh, what we support is different uh, identity, uh, identity provider, uh, like um, what we mainly use is OAuth or LDAP. Um, you can use uh, Google as logon possibility, you can, uh, you can use uh, GitHub, but you can even provide us your own uh, identity provider and then we can integrate it, or your Active Directory and we can integrate it and you can use this users for the management. Um, so what we want to have is like a seamless management and cluster login, so really single sign on for the user, they don't need additional users on our side. And the next step, we want to also, um, we support Airbag and network policies inside our clusters, but we want to like push it from the outside uh, provider inside to the cluster. This is something where we're currently working on. Uh, no, you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and what we ha want to have is like, we want to provide m multiple uh, providers. So we want to have the same setup of the, or what we have now is the same setup of the Kubernetes cluster uh, master uh, on every provider because we every time run Kubernetes, we can do this more or less anywhere. And um, what we only need is like, we must deploy a VM. We need Docker or a container runtime on it and kubelet and configure the kubelet and then we are done. So um, the complex part, running and maintaining the cluster, we can take it every time and put it to the new, new cloud uh, provider or to a different um, provider. As long as we have a Kubernetes running, um, we, we are fast and easy to, to set this up. And um, the good thing with this is also when you have different setups, so um, uh, in this case like uh, OpenStack and bare metal. Um, the same team can operate all of them because, like, the master control plane works every every time the same. So you don't have this challenge. Oh, now I'm on this platform. I have a completely different tooling or I have a different deployment method than on another platform. Um, all of the setup is more or less the same. Like 99% is same. There are of course flavors which is different, like load balancer, storage, um, um, and how we deploy, especially on bare metal, uh, the nodes. But like all the communication, all the stuff is done the same and um, it's easy for the team um, to operate all these clusters and uh, to manage all this. Okay. So now we would like to talk a bit about the hybrid setup and uh, the way we uh, set all this up and got it running. Some of you might think, oh, this is kind of unusual. These guys are taking like bare metal servers, they're installing hypervisors on it, OpenStack, and all this stuff. And on top of that, they're putting Kubernetes. Well, and on top of that, they're putting the Kubernetes into Kubernetes. How does this work? And is this a good idea? Yes, it is. It's a good idea because we can use existing APIs, uh, which we already have in OpenStack. It allows us uh, to leverage things like storage as well via the Cinder API and use images and also uh, scheduling underneath, which uh, we need within OpenStack. So it also, uh, one thing we're working on at the moment is our second cloud region. It's gonna go online, I think in January or February uh, next year. So that will then allow us to integrate uh, two cloud regions within the installer and the customers will be able to use something similar to Federate, I suppose. You'll be able to distribute your um, um, worker nodes between the two regions. We also have um, certain customers um, have um, very specific demands. They don't want to run on a shared platform. They say, okay, OpenStack and uh, hypervisors with, uh, shared by different customers is not an option for them. So we can also integrate bare metal servers that we have in our data center. A customer may rent three or four uh, bare metal servers or even a whole rack of servers for his own personal use with his own switching and uh, routing equipment to make sure he's completely isolated from other, any other customers. Uh, we also run two storage zones. We work with a uh, storage provider from Berlin called Quobite, Quobite and uh, they offer us a storage which we uh, utilize via the uh, Cinder API, which allows us to have two different storage zones in both data centers. Uh, all of the nodes have SSDs for the storage, so it's very fast as well. 
Um, integration of additional data centers or cloud providers is possible. Um, uh, Loads have done a lot of work on that for other customers. They've already integrated DigitalOcean, AWS, uh, Google, and it will be easy to integrate any further partners that we may have, or even maybe an on-prem solution if the customer's got a form of API which we can authenticate and uh, some form of um, provisioning service or VMs, it can be used. So it's fairly easy to extend uh, this setup as well, which is great for us as well because it offers a lot of flexibility as well. What I'd like to show you next is a live demonstration. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this is going to work out. We're going to uh, start up a live demonstration on our servers in Berlin. So long distance, let's hope it works out. So basically, this is uh, the interface at its current state. It's a, a very simple interface. Um, we did this deliberately, so there's nothing, uh, not much of, uh, not many uh, menu options here or anything. You can basically, what you start off with is that you upload your uh, SSH key, which I've already done here, to uh, distribute on all the worker nodes. We've basically got the uh, manage cluster and the create cluster. And we're gonna uh, try and create a cluster here. Um, oh, keep on. Yep, and then we continue to the providers. You can see here, we have uh, our OpenStack and our bare metal service here. So we're not gonna try and provision a bare metal service here because it will probably take too long, but what we're gonna try and do is uh, start up a cluster on OpenStack. So we select OpenStack as provider. We continue to then select the data center. At the moment, as I said, we have one region that we're running all this stuff on. From January onwards, you'll be able to choose the region you run it or run uh, different work workloads on different regions. So basically here um, is a, an option to add my tenant and everything, which I'm gonna do now. So I'm just gonna quickly uh, add in my data. At the moment, uh, we're running the stuff that we have on Ubuntu. Let me just grab my password. Uh, just copy this. Yeah. So that's basically all that we need to do. We'll also add my SSH key. Uh, sorry, pull it down here. Add my SSH key. And that's basically all we do. So what we've got here, we're using the, all the default settings. Basically, I've got my tenant already added. I'm going to uh, spin up three uh, machines with the Ubuntu 1604, and afterwards, hopefully, install the kubelet on them and connect them to the master. So we can review the settings here, uh, what we've created. And basically, after that, we create the cluster. And if everything works out, we should see some master components coming up. So as you can see now on the dashboard, we've got these uh, twirling symbols at the top showing us the health of our uh, master components. So we're running uh, Kubernetes 1.8.4 here. We can also decide which versions we want to provide for our customers. So basically, we check the versions first, and then we're able to um, uh, to activate them here. Or we could also uh, allow specific customers only to see specific versions. So we can already see we've got the first green button here. That should be our ETCD. So uh, the ETCD operator is deployed. We have a three node ETCD cluster with a uh, persistent volume underneath. So the ETCD cluster takes snapshots onto that persistent volume, which also allows it to be recovered as Sebastian mentioned earlier, which is of course uh, a great thing to have because I'm not sure if anyone of you have tried to recover an ETCD from a broken state. It can be a pain. So uh, we should also see an API server coming up at the moment. Yes, we've got it. A cube controller and a scheduler. So um, we've nearly got all of the master components up. Once they are up and running, we should see the uh, creation of our worker nodes to actually distribute our workload on. So we'll just wait for a moment for this to happen. And then I can quickly show you in the OpenStack dashboard the VMs that are created. So how many of you, if I can quickly ask a question while we're running our demonstration, are actually running Kubernetes uh, in a production environment at the moment? Oh, quite a few people. And how many of you have actually got a working CI CD pipeline up and running? Oh, also quite a few people, because that was uh, something that I was quite interested in, because you see lots of talks about CI CD pipelines at the moment. Seems to be an issue at the moment in the community. Okay, so we see 
Our uh, nodes are ready. They are uh, being created. Let's see if we can see them here in our dashboard. Hopefully, if everything works out. Oh, it's logged me out. I'll just quickly log back in again. Yep, so we have uh, the three VMs that we created with zero minutes. So they're just coming up and waiting to be uh, provisioned. So the next thing that would happen after they pre provisioned, they will get their kubelet. The kubelet will start, and then they should, hopefully, if everything works out, they should join the master. Then, basically, all that we need to do after that is we have uh, a button here, which then allows us to download a uh, pre-configured uh, cube config for that customer, and then you can basically start running. So basically, as you see from uh, um, zero to go Kubernetes in about five minutes, which of course is very simple. Every single developer can set up his own cluster if he needs to, or he can share a cluster with uh, other members of staff if he uh, needs to. So we should see that coming up shortly. Yeah, and, and what you see also on the top is, uh, currently we run the latest version, but um, it's, it's grayed out. Um, there's the upgrade button, so when there's a new version available, the developer can decide, okay, upgrade, uh, press the upgrade button, and then first we'll upgrade the master, and later upgrade uh, the nodes. And of course, the developer can add or remove nodes uh, depending on their requirements. So um, they are completely flexible, can define, okay, what workloads do I run uh, when I want to scale up, uh, when I want to scale down, and um, yeah, have then a plain uh, vanilla Kubernetes with dashboard and all the stuff um, running, um, can use uh, storage classes um, out of the box uh, from OpenStack, um, and it really feels like for the developer, like a Google Container Engine, um, they easily can also move uh, from there uh, um, into the setup and can work that, deploy the application there. Yeah. So we see our first worker node has just come up now. So we see we've got our green indicator here. So the other one should come up within a few minutes. It normally takes about roughly about five minutes for everything to come up. So we can basically then download the cube config here if we want to. And config. And let's see. And I would think they wouldn't be ready yet, but they should be ready. Yeah. So here we can see two of the machines already ready, as you can also see here on the side. They've already signed up to the master, and the others are just about to be registered. So we should see them all coming up now. Yep. So we've got the last two aren't quite ready, but that would happen in a few seconds. Yeah, so that's basically uh, it from the uh, demonstration side. Should we go back to the presentation? Or yeah. Did you um, one more thing I talked about already. Um, our cube node is uh, open source. Um, if you're interested into it, we are in discussion with the machine API uh, where we want to integrate. Additional, where we're currently working on, because what we see from the customer it's one to get uh, like clusters up on the other side. We must get workload on, on it. And we were looking around and also had a discussion uh, with Simon, OK, what's the best way to do this? And uh, played around with Jenkins and other tools and everything. We every time want to run native on Kubernetes. Uh, so we were thinking, OK, is, why is there not a native tool for Kubernetes to run Kuber, Kubernetes uh, uh, workloads or CI CD workloads? And we come up with the idea building uh, kubeci, which is an uh, extension to drone CI and uh, which makes drone CI possible to run on Kubernetes. So instead of connecting to the Docker socket, uh, it will in the future um, spin up. Um, uh, pods and um, also have some plugins already developed for your kubectl and for Helm. So we want to make a package so that um, Simon can go to their customers and say, "Hey, here is an easy pipeline. Put this in in your Git repository, and then we get it on our platform." And um, everything works natively. Uh, we can easily manage this. Yeah. Okay. So let's come back to our last uh, few slides then. Yeah. Thank you. 
So basically, I want to uh, quickly uh, wrap this up and uh, talk to you about some of the uh, lessons we learned and about the uh, future roadmap uh, where we're actually uh, going and some of our targets that we have uh, for 2018. So uh, basically, as uh, Sebastian said, we need to uh, wrap this thing up with some tooling. We, uh, the K8S service is not enough. People need uh, workshops, people need uh, the correct tooling to enable them to be able to deploy their applications. Most people aren't, don't, aren't, or most developers don't really have this great interest in Kubernetes. Most people have the great interest in their apps, which is good. They want to be able to deploy them in a standardized way. And they don't want to uh, um, be having to uh, go through the internet or read for ages until they can find out how to do that. So we want to allow, enable them to do that with an easy way. Um, what we did first is we used the same port for every single API request. What we did is we were using SNI, so we were sending uh, HTTP headers to distinguish the different clusters. That worked. It worked well with like standard tooling, but we had quite a few problems to accomplish there. For instance, things like Prometheus, they want to do a service discovery within the cluster, and they don't use the host name. They send like a direct request to the IP address, so it wasn't accessing the correct cluster, and there was also a few other tools that had problems with that. So we decided to change this and to give every customer a unique port for uh, his API server, but always use the same IP address so that we've got that unique service endpoint that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Yeah, one of the things we definitely run into when we were first, uh, had our first uh, 15, 20 clusters running, I think, was a severe ETCD uh, problem. We actually uh, decided that it would be a good idea, which it wasn't, to limit the resources the ETCD can use. It crashed on us. Because we had so much data, because we were running Kubernetes in these namespaces, it created a lot more ETCD data than uh, we had previously, and it basically crashed the database and we needed to recover from it, which took me quite a while. Um, take regular ETCD sh snapshots on persistent volumes. Always make sure that you have a decent backup of all these ETCD data. It is definitely a lifesaver if anything goes wrong. Do that for every individual cluster, but also for the master cluster as well. That was definitely also a very important thing that we found that we needed to do. And also restrict access to master components. May sound weird, but you saw this also from AWS and also Google won't allow you anywhere near the ETCD. It's normally a good idea to keep your customers away from these sort of things. I mean, give them a button where they can update it, but don't allow them to just uh, update to any version because it would break. And we had customers which actually decided they would try an alpha version of Kubernetes, which of course didn't work correctly on our platform. So that's why we uh, make sure that we are the people that actually give uh, give out the, or hand out the versions which can be installed. And uh, last but not least is uh, our roadmap. Um, one of the things we're working on at the moment is improving the cluster authentication. Um, we, we're working on a, a role-based uh, access control system similar to what um, AWS was talking to in the opening keynote, like IAM. Sounds something interesting, something that we're going to need to later on to make sure that we can restrict developers um, to certain namespaces and also to certain tasks as well within the cluster and maybe give people read-only access and other things. Quite a few of our customers um, need these. Worker node autoscaling is also a thing. I mean, due to Kubernetes, most of you know, you have the horizontal pod autoscaling, which makes it easy uh, on a CPU load or maybe on HTTP requests um, to scale the pods. But what do you actually do when you've reached the uh, capacity of your three worker nodes? We need to know this, and we need to be able to scale the worker nodes up to a limit so the customer could maybe say, OK, I want to scale between three and 10 worker nodes. So that's also something that we're working on at the moment, which I think we'll be able to release uh, early next year. Um, support for different Linux distributions is also a thing at the moment. Our cloud is running on Ubuntu, and we are running Ubuntu too for the worker nodes. But we had quite a few people that said, oh, why don't you support CentOS? Why don't you support CoreOS? What about all these auto-updating features of CoreOS? We want this. We don't want to use Ubuntu. So that's also something that we're looking into at the moment. Um, another thing that we're doing at the moment is also configuring an external load balancer. I mean, Google, they're uh, in a, uh, in a um, 
a happy position that they have a load balancer which is distributed on and announced at 150 uh, different points of presence. We don't. I mean, we're a medium-sized service provider. We have three or four data centers which we can run on, and we uh, would like to use an external um, load balancer for this. So one of the things that can be used is Cloudflare. We basically modified and also put it in a, re a pull request for uh, external DNS. It's on the uh, Contrap um, repo of Kubernetes. And that allows us then to monitor ingress resources and automatically update Cloudflare with IP addresses of new worker nodes and new ingress resources. So uh, Cloudflare actively does health checks on the worker nodes and we can also add new ones and get them in the um, load balancing pool automatically without touching Cloudflare. So we just use the Cloudflare API for that. And uh, also um, drone, which Sebastian just talked about, is we would like a standard way for CI, CD, something which a new customer may uh, start off with us and he's looking, what, what, can I, what can I do? How can I deploy? There's so many different deployment tools around and um, we think drone could be a good idea. I tried deploying stuff with Jenkins. It works, but it's complicated and we'd like a unified way so that uh, uh, the time to market for the customers is very short and it would be easy to transform a setup which is uh, running on conventional VMs into a containerized setup. And uh, the last, um, last bullet point is basically automate the upgrade process. The We've already automated the master upgrade process, but uh, afterwards you need to add further worker nodes and then drain these worker nodes to get to the new version. We would like to completely automate this and take all that pain away from the customers. It only takes about 30 minutes to do this, but I mean, it's still 30 minutes of your time. So, does anybody have any questions that you would like to ask if you have a few minutes of time? We're actually out of time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, if, if, you have, if you have questions, uh, we are still here, or otherwise uh, we also have a boost, um, we have a loot to boost, come by and uh, we can discuss.